The periodic table of the elements is a central icon for chemistry and embodies much of chemical knowledge in one chart. Yet there was a time before the 1860s when chemists didn't know how to organize or explain the properties of all the elements they were discovering. It took the work of Dmitry Mendeleev and many others to make sense of this confusion. The discovery of the periodic law and its development into a system for organizing the elements was a turning point in unearthing the elements. Have you ever wondered where the chemical elements come from, how they were discovered, and how they are mined, refined, and turned into finished products? Would you like to know where materials like glass, steel, and concrete come from? Do you need to find out how energy is produced, the environmental impacts and hazards of chemicals, or the history of chemistry? Student teams from communities around the country are interviewing scientists, engineers, and historians to answer these questions in The Elements Unearthed, Our Discovery and Usage of the Chemical Elements. This episode of The Elements Unearthed was made possible by a research fellowship provided by the American section of the Société de Chimie Industrielle at the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The periodic table of the elements, as we usually see it, has become one of the most recognizable and iconic charts in modern culture, so much so that it is even used in works of art. Our hard-earned knowledge of why the elements can be organized in this fashion has been a central quest of chemistry since the table was first invented in the 1860s. To find out more about the history and importance of the periodic table, we interviewed Dr. Eric Sherry of UCLA author of the book, The Periodic Table, Its Story and Its Significance, published by Oxford University Press. This episode will also make use of publication artwork and notes written by Edward G. Mazurs for his 1957 and 1974 work, Graphic Representations of the Periodic System During 100 Years, in which he classified over 700 versions of the periodic table. Mazurs was a professor of chemistry who immigrated to the United States following World War II. Working as a janitor, he self-published the 1957 edition. He eventually became professor of chemistry at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, where he revised and expanded his book for the second edition, published by University of Alabama Press in 1974. Upon his death in 1983, his notes and publication artwork were donated to the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia. Every chemistry student needs to understand the principles behind the periodic table. It's the, the key to all of chemistry. It unifies all of chemistry. It's as if you've, the periodic table captures chemistry in one chart. You have the sense that all the knowledge is there. Even if you don't know it from the beginning, it's all stored in the periodic table. In fact, there's a sense in which the periodic table still has new knowledge waiting to be discovered. You know, when they discovered high temperature superconductors a few years ago, uh, it happened to be a compound of uh, scandium, I believe, scandium oxygen and various other elements that was a high temperature superconductor. And so when they went looking for other possible high temperature superconductors, all they needed to do was to look on the periodic table and look in a vertical column and find that the element yttrium lies right below scandium and so it was a good bet that yttrium would behave similarly to scandium and sure enough they actually discovered a better high temperature superconductor by doing that. So there's a sense in which the periodic table contains a tremendous amount of information, known information and information that's yet to be discovered. The periodic table can be a bit hard for beginning students to understand. I think they should start to become familiar with the idea of groups are vertical columns and periods which are the horizontal rows and the basic idea is that elements that fall within a group or a vertical column have similar chemical properties let's take for instance lithium sodium and potassium they're soft grayish metals they can be cut with a knife all of them they all react with water and as you move down the group in fact they become their reactions with water become more and more vigorous on the other hand, as you move across a period, there's a tremendous variation in properties. So groups and periods are, the, if you like, the two dimensions of the periodic table. 
The, the discovery of the periodic st system involves two general themes. One is that certain elements have similar chemical properties. Now that's a qualitative similarity. The other main ingredient of the periodic table is quantitative information, by which I mean especially at atomic weights. This dates back to John Dalton, a Manchester school teacher, who first had the idea that you could indirectly compare the weights of different atoms. One really crucial discovery was a discovery of something called triads of elements. And let me go back again to the example of lithium, sodium, and potassium. It, it had been known for a while that these elements behaved similarly chemically. Uh, it turns out that the atomic weight of one of the elements, sodium, is approximately the average of the atomic weights of the two flanking elements. In other words, if you take the atomic weight of lithium and add it to the atomic weight of potassium and divide by two, you find approximately the atomic weight of sodium. So this suggested that there was some numerical order underneath the elements. Now, that is really the beginning of the periodic table. So at this point, people be began to discover other triads of elements. Then people began to put triads together, as it were. And then you begin to get the other dimension of the periodic table, the periods. There were some blind alleys, for instance, going back to the idea of triads. Triads looked very, very interesting, very enticing. So people looked for triads and, and thought they had found triads where there were no real triads. In the hands of some people, it became numerology, and it became a distraction. One important blind alley was Prout's Law. Prout's Law was, was a very interesting development because Prout looked at the uh, atomic weights that people had determined and noticed a rather obvious thing that most of the atomic weights, or at least a large number of them, are integral multiples of the weight of hydrogen. Um, and he suggested the obvious conclusion is that all the elements are made of hydrogen, are composites of hydrogen. And so there would be a unity of matter. Everything would essentially be made of one stuff. This is Prout's hypothesis. Now, the result of that was that it encouraged people to measure atomic weights more accurately. Because according to Prout, the, the, those atomic weights that didn't fall into line were simply due to the fact he thought that those atomic weights had not been determined accurately enough. An important one is, for instance, chlorine. Chlorine has an atomic weight of 35.5. Now, you can't get further away from an integral multiple of hydrogen than 0.5. So to Prout, this was a mistake. This was a, uh, an artifact of the measurements of atomic weights. And he believed that eventually they would all be whole numbers. But it turned out they were not all whole numbers. The chlorine measurement refused to go away. The copper measurement, copper's atomic weight, is also a stubborn exception to Prout's law. A major watershed event took place in Karlsruhe, Germany in 1860 that would lead directly to the development of the periodic table. The Karlsruhe conference was a meeting held in Karlsruhe, Germany in 1860. It was convened by August Kekulé, famous German chemist, and this was meant to resolve a number of outstanding issues that had arisen in chemistry. One of them was the question of what is an atom, what is a molecule, and things of that kind. There were many, many different formulas for the same compound. There were almost as many formulas for the same compound as there were authors writing textbooks. So there was great confusion. These, these things had to be sorted out. They had to be ironed out.